To download more lectures, learn more about our project, and to help support it, visit www.bayina.com slash dream. That's B-A-Y-Y-I-N-A-H slash dream. You are free to share these recordings with family and friends. Thank you and Jazakumullah Khairan for helping us make our dream a reality. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والضحى والليل إذا سجى ما ودعك ربك وما قلى وللآخرة خير لك من الأولى ولسوف يعطيك ربك فترضى ألم يجدك يتيما فآوى ووجدك ضالا فهدى ووجدك عائلا فأغنى فأما اليتيم فلا تقهر وأما السائل فلا تنهر وأما بنعمة ربك فحدث اللهم تقبل منا تلاوات القرآن جزاك الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين إن شاء الله تعالى we begin today a study of سورة الضحى I hope all of you enjoyed the wonderful recitation today it's a change of flavor إن شاء الله تعالى uh, with, with our beloved uh, Tajweed teacher, Hafiq Wassam. Um, as I described last time we were here a couple of weeks ago, we're going to start our study of every surah with a series of parallels that it contains with the surah that preceded it. So that's how we're going to start. We're going to look at a comparative, we're doing, we're doing a comparative look between Surah Al Layl and Surah Al Duha, Surah Al Layl being the surah we studied last time. From a stylistic point of view, from the area of Al Badi'ah, we noticed that in Surah Al-Layl, Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned the night first and the day second. وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَى وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّى So the night was mentioned first and the day was mentioned second. Now as a contrast, what we're going to see here is the day is mentioned first and the night is mentioned second. الضُحَى The morning light. The duha refers to light, the light of the sun, also refers to the early time of the morning. And then وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى So day first and night second. So that's one contrast. Keep that in mind as we look at the other contrasts in these wonderful surahs. In the previous surah, the addressee, the audience, primarily was the Quraysh. They were the audience of that surah. The audience of this surah is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's a completely different audience, a contrast in who is being addressed is the second difference in parallel between these two surahs. 
Surah Al-Layl ends the conclusion, we said this before, the conclusion of a given surah is tied to the introduction of the next as Al-Biqa'i comments and As-Sami Ra'i also. So in the conclusion of the previous surah we read, وَلَا سَوْفَ يَرْضَى Those were the last words we read in the previous surah, that soon he will be pleased. إِلَّا بْتِغَاءَ وَجْهِ رَبِّهِ الْأَعْلَى وَلَا سَوْفَ يَرْضَى With the exception of the one who pursues the face of his Lord or, or his, of his Master, meaning he is in pursuit of Allah's contentment, and that's the only goal before them, this is the one who will finally be truly pleased and satisfied. In this surah, we learn who is the most qualified of that title, that they will finally be pleased. In the very beginning of this surah, we're going to learn, وَلَا سَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى That your master will give you, meaning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then you will be pleased. So in the previous surah, generally, whoever does this, whoever pursues the face of their master will be pleased. Now we're learning, well, who actually truly pursues the face of their master? It is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he in fact will be pleased. فَتَرْضَى so to Layl makes a promise about making ease. We read this last time, فَأَمَّا مَنْ أَعْطَى وَاتَّقَى وَصَدَّقَ بِالْحُسْنَى فَسَنُ يَسِّرُهُ لِلْيُسْرَى You know, you fulfill certain conditions if you recall, and at the end of it, although the gift Allah will give you, He will make the easiest thing facilitated for you. The easiest thing being Allah's guidance and, and obedience to Allah. He will make that path easy. But you know, we also learn and acknowledge that the path to truth in the surah before even was described as difficult, al-aqaba, this high mountain you have to climb up. Now the messenger himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is in a struggle, which obviously is difficult. So while the previous surah promised ease, this surah acknowledges that the, the, the struggles of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are becoming very difficult. So he is being given promise that it's going to get better. So it's almost a continuation of what, what started in the previous surah. Here Allah says, وَلَلْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى It's like giving His Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam this, this uh, uh, almost consolation that you, it's gonna get better. The, the, what is coming eventually is better than the earliest. Also in this surah we found, وَلَسَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكْ Soon your Lord will give you. And when the ayah comes, we'll discuss that in more detail. Another wonderful comparison between these two surahs is, in the previous surah Allah mentioned the one who gives. فَأَمَّا مَنْ أَعْطَى وَاتَّقَى وَصَدَّقَ بِالْحُسْنَى أَعْطَى The one who gave. So giving was attributed to the human being, he should give. But in this surah, it is the contrast, Allah is the one who is giving. وَلَا سَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ Your master will soon give you. So in the previous surah, the human being was giving, and it's like Allah is responding, you gave, and now Allah is giving, subhanahu wa ta'ala, your master will give. In the previous surah, we learned simple term, of accepting or confirming the truth of Islam, وَصَدَّقَ بِالْحُسْنَى That he confirmed the truth in the most beautiful good. He confirmed the truth in the most beautiful good. And in the Messenger's own life, he was also seeking that truth and eventually Allah Azza wa Jal revealed it to him. And those are the words, وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًا فَهَدًا And you know, we shouldn't casually translate that. You know the word ضَال, just like in Surah Al-Fatiha, is translated misled, right? Or lost. So you, some people have translated even, you know, he found you lost and guided you. But that requires a little bit more discussion because we should be careful when we speak about the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Another yet amazing comparison and parallel and lesson between these two surahs and their comparative discourse is the mention of mal and the mention of giving of ghina. Ghina in Arabic, if you don't recall, is the, uh, the, the state in which someone doesn't need anybody else. Allah says about himself, Wallahu al-ghani. Allah is free of need, He doesn't need anybody else. A ghanim in the worldly sense is someone who's so rich, they don't need any money, they don't need anybody's help, they can do everything on their own. This is ghina. In the previous surah we learned, Allah Azza wa says, وَمَا يُغْنِي عَنْهُ مَالُهُ إِذَا تَرَدَّى His wealth will not be able to make him ghani. His wealth will not be able to make him free of need. He thinks his wealth is gonna make him free of need, but when he falls into the ditch, his wealth will not be of any benefit. This is what we learned in the previous surah. So we're learning here that wealth will not make you free of need. In this surah, the positive side. Okay, so well, wealth is not going to make one free of need. So where is, how are we going to become free of need? Allah Azza wa Jal says in this surah, وَوَجَدَكَ عَائِلًا فَأَغْنَى He found you in a desperate state, and he made you free of need. So it's not mal that gives ghina, it is Allah that gives ghina. Allah makes someone free of need. Allah takes care of their needs. So the, the pursuit of wealth is being contrasted with the one who pursues Allah. 
And that's why in the previous surah we found in its conclusion, ibtigha'a wajhi rabbihi, the pursuit of the face of his master, as opposed to the pursuit of what? As opposed to the pursuit of wealth. So, going further, we find in the previous surah, Allah Azza wa mentions similarly again about mal, الَّذِي يُؤْتِي مَا لَهُ يَتَزَكَّى The one who gives his wealth in order to cleanse himself. Now what are some avenues in which you can give wealth? They are discussed in this surah, فَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرْ وَأَمَّا السَّائِلَ فَلَا تَنْهَرْ As for the orphan, as for the one who asks, and we're going to talk about the injunctions of Allah, don't turn them away, don't humiliate them, don't you know, embarrass them, etc. Now the ultimate blessing, the ultimate blessing in the previous surah was at the end, the ultimate goal, and that if somebody can achieve that, they've attained the ultimate blessing, that was, إِلَّا بْتِغَاءَ وَجْهِ رَبِّهِ الْأَعْلَى وَلَا سَوْفَ يَرْضَى That's the ultimate blessing. And when somebody has the ultimate blessing, they should be grateful for it, and they should acknowledge that, that favor that has been done upon them. At the conclusion of this surah, in Surah Al-Duha, we find, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثِ Interestingly, on the matter of guidance, both surahs talk about guidance. Allah Azza wa makes a declaration in the previous surah, إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا لَلْهُدَى We have taken exclusively upon ourselves truly the matter of guiding. Guiding is only and exclusively something that Allah Azza wa gives, and we talked about that last time. In this surah, Allah, because He's the one who owns it, He even shows us how this favor was given to His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًّا فَهَدَى so he took ownership of guidance in the last surah and shows how he guided his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam in this surah. Uh, uh, an interesting contrast between two kinds of needy. In the previous surah, we were the needy and we were seeking Allah's pleasure. In this surah, the needy come to us and we shouldn't turn them away. So there's these two kinds of needy that are being described and the lesson we're learning here is the one who's truly in need of the favor of Allah and the, pers- and the pleasure of Allah, they will never be turning away anybody else who comes towards them with a needy face. So we actually re- recognize the faqr and the, the ayla, as we say in, in, in the language of our own selves. As far as the layout of this surah is concerned, it begin- begins with a couple of oaths. وَالضُّحَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَعَنْ This is a consistent theme we've been observing in these series of surahs. They begin with oaths, a number of them. And the oath, as we said before, is a means by which you are asked to reflect and it prepares you for the lesson that is about to come. The fundamental lesson of the surah is favors Allah gives His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is what we're going to find in this surah and the next surah. They're paired together in that they are special surahs about Allah giving His Messenger favors alayhi salatu wa salam. The final of these, the surah that culminates the favor in its ultimate form, will be Surah Al-Kawthar, when we read, Inna a'taynaka al-Kawthar. But before that, these two surahs are also dedicated to Allah explicitly describing the favor that He gives His Messenger wasallam. So we'll explore the relationship between the oaths that were taken in the beginning of the surah and what they have to do with the fact of the favors that Allah does for His Messenger wasallam. So this is essentially the, the first part of the surah, the oaths and then the favors given to the, His Messenger wasallam, And the conclusion, now that the favors have been done to you, what should you do in return? As a show of gratitude to Allah, what should your response be, O Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And as a result, what should we be learning when favors are done upon us? Now, Abduha, we begin ta'ala with the study of the surah itself. As far as the context of revelation is concerned, يُذْكَرْ أَنَّهُ إِنْ قَطَعَ الْوَحْيُ أَيَّامًا that the, the, It's mentioned that the uh, revelation was discontinued for a few days. فَحَزَنَ الرَّسُولُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, Then the, the Messenger والسلام, was you know, depressed and he was very saddened that revelation stopped coming. لذلك حَزَنًا شَدِيدًا حَتَّى قَالَ قَسَمٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ مَا نَرَى رَبُّكَ إِلَّا وَدَّعَكْ وَقَلَاكْ You know, he was intensely grieved by the fact that revelation stopped coming for a while, this fatra, this gap. Until a group from among the mushrikun, some of, like Ibn Kathir rahimahullah mentions, it was the wife of Abu Lahab, right? That, that actually said this or started this kind of sarcastic comment. They basically said, oh, we, 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 we see that your Lord, or your Master has pretty much said goodbye to you. What da'ak? The only thing left for him to do now is to say goodbye to you, and he's abandoned you, and he's unhappy with you, it seems. Waqalak. What da'aka bi ma'na tarakaka, wa qalaka bi ma'na abghadaka wa tarakak. What da'a means to, you know, he's abandoned you, he's left you, and qalak, 
a qala that's going to come in the ayah also, is that he is displeased with you. So some of Fasirun say, because of these sharp comments of the mushrikun, it is in response to those comments that this surah was revealed. Before we go any further, you have to understand some, some things about the historical scenario that we're dealing with. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is delivering this message. And he is ultimately concerned with the plight of humanity. We have to appreciate the burden on his shoulders. And I mention those words strategically because in the next surah, Allah will talk about that burden. Okay? Allah Azza wa Jalla will mention wizr. Wizr meaning the burden on the shoulders of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's no more messengers coming. If he does not deliver the message properly, then it's not just the Quraysh who get destroyed, all of humanity is destroyed. It's an enormous amount of pressure on his shoulders. Alayhi salatu wasalam. So when he's delivering this message and people are not accepting, instead of complaining that the people are not accepting, he's constantly worried, maybe I didn't do something right. Maybe there was something missing in my efforts. So he's always, almost internally blaming himself. And Allah Azza wa Jal constantly tells him, this is not your fault, you have nothing to worry about. You know, th these people, they're the ones that are at fault, etc. So Allah constantly consoles His Messenger. But, the Quraysh see this opportunity of a few weeks or a few days of revelation not coming, and what do they say? Oh, no new ayahs today? No surah today? Oh, I suppose He's not happy with you anymore. And they're chuckling among each other, they think it's funny that they make these kinds of sarcastic remarks to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now the Messenger والسلام, not that those words, he gives them weight, but it's the thought starts creeping in his mind that maybe, maybe I did do something wrong. Maybe that's why revelation stopped coming. Maybe that's why revelation stopped coming. One of the benefits of knowing the, 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 the oath in the beginning, the first ayah of the surah, al-duha, Allah swears by the morning light. Al-duha is the time of day in which there is activity. Al-Fajr is still early morning. People are just starting to wake up. But al duha it's hustling and bustling, it's rush hour on the highway, everything's moving around. It's the time of basically, the time of day that is full of life, that's full of life and activity and movement. That's al duha Allah swears by that time, and by the way, uh, we, we mentioned some of this before, you know, when, we, when the word duha came up, the light of the sun can be soothing and it can also be scorching, right? Later on in the day, it can get pretty intense and it's painful. But early in the morning, the light of the sun is actually soothing and wonderful. And it's, it's something lively. Allah swears by the soothing light of the morning. And what that teaches us is, it's a parallel drawn between the revelation coming upon the Messenger wasallam. When the revelation used to come to him, it was like the soothing light of the sun falling upon him. It was, it was full of life. Now let's look at the next oath. Actually, before we go to the next oath, some evidence is in the Qur'an, how Allah talks about the duha. وَأَنْ يُحْشَرَ النَّاسُ ضُحًا That people would be gathered at duha time. Even the Qur'an alludes to the fact that people are hustling and bustling at duha time. A little bit of a, a small passage from Dr. Fadl Salih Hassan al-Ra'i that I'd like to read and translate for you. وَقَدْ أَخْصَمَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى بِالْضُحَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى Allah has certainly taken an oath by a duha the soothing morning, and also by the night as it becomes still and lifeless. سَجَى وَاللَّيْلِ I swear by night. إِذَا سَجَى when it becomes still and lifeless. Let's see what else he says. وَهُمَا وَقْتَانْ فِي مُنْتَهَ الرِّقَّةِ عَلَى النَّفْسِ الْبَشَرِيَّةِ He adds another comment of, of uh, reflection on this. He says these, both of these times are important from a psychological point of view on the human nafs, on the human personality. Islah, he commented on this further. He said that, you know, these two, things, these two times are very, very opposite. And Allah is alluding to these two times because these are the two it alludes to different kinds of emotions or situations people face. Sometimes life is easy, sometimes life is difficult. Sometimes there's happiness, sometimes there's sadness. Sometimes there's ease, sometimes there's difficulty. Sometimes there's relaxation, other times there's pain. And you would think, why isn't there always ease? Why isn't there always relaxation? But if you reflect, you will learn just like the night and the day, the night when it becomes totally still, it is the time that all of you know, the animals and human beings, they get a chance to rest and sleep. That is an important part of life, to go through the darkness. So what we're learning by, almost by drawing a conclusion from that is, going through hard times in life is actually a part of life. And you have to go through it because there are some things in our personality, some good qualities that Allah put in us, you never get to harness them and to develop them until you are put in a difficult situation. I'll give you an example, sabr. If life is always easy, 
you would never learn to have sabr. It's a quality Allah put inside of us, it's a virtue Allah put inside of us, but it only comes out, and it only manifests, and it only blooms under difficult circumstances. Gratitude. Only when something is taken away, you become more grateful of what, what, what you had. And when you get even a little, the gratitude comes out in harnesses. So even in difficulty, there's a blessing. The, the day has its soothness and its comfort and its relaxation, and yes, the night is still and deathly, and it's, you know, it's motionless, and it's depressing, but both of them have a role to play. So he, that's what he's talking about as far as them having a, a, an effect on the person. But the other thing that's also really interesting, is that both of these times are very soothing. In the, the morning time is relaxing, and the, the deepest part of night is also basically a time of deep rest. We will find the soft language is used from a, from a badiyah, from an embellishment point of view, because the entire surah is talking about the Messenger wasallam. So we'll find language that even the choice of words illustrates Allah's love for His Messenger wasallam. وَالْمَعَانِي وَالرَّقِيقَ الْمَعَانِي مَا يَضِلُّ عَلَى مُحَبَّةِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى لِلرَّسُولِ وَلُطْفِهِ وَعِنَايَتِهِ بِهِ Subhanallah that these words, the choice of words is we're going to find in this surah, they allude to the love Allah has, the intense love Allah has for the Messenger wasallam, and the subtle beautiful words he chooses in the context of the discussion with him. So what is the definition of al-duha? We said already, fi huwa waqt al-rtifa'i shams ba'd al-shuruq. It's the time of the rising of the sun, sun after shuruq, it's kind of late morning. That's the time of duha. Now let's talk a little bit about as-saja, and the, the use of that word, inshallah, in, the, in this ayah. Saja, I said two things, but it really in the meaning there are three things meant. The first meaning of saja is a sukun, stillness. That's the first part of the saja. So when Allah, Allah is swearing by night, He does this in other places. Wallayli ida yaqsha, wallayli ida yasr. So what's different between wallayli ida yaqsha, the night as it covers, wallayli ida yasr, the night as it eases in and eases out, and then wallayli ida. Saja. Why is saja the best choice of words here as opposed to those ayat in other ayat in which Allah talks about the night? In all of them there is motion. Yawsha, there's movement of the night. Yasr, there's departing of the night or arrival of the night. But here there's stillness, in qitar. It's cut off, it's still, it's not moving. And the theme of the surah is when revelation stopped coming. So the word chosen is that which is, alludes to discontinu- discontinuity. It stopped. If yasha or yasr are used, there's motion in them. But there's stillness in this one, and there's death in this one. There's, you know, and actually saj is used for even saj al the, the, the corpse was still. Laylun saj, the adjective is used in Arabic literature. When the night becomes completely motionless, not even a leaf is moving. S- similarly, sajja ma'aib akhik. There's an expression in Arabic, cover and, you know, hide, completely bury so they become still the faults of your brother. This is an Arab, Arabic proverb from even before Islam. Now, I alluded to the fact that even the darkest of night and the brightest of day, both of them have a purpose. And subhanAllah, Allah tells us this Himself. He says, هُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ اللَّيْلَ لِتَسْكُنُوا فِيهِ وَالنَّهَارَ مُبْصِرًا He is the one who made the night for you, so you can find tranquility and stillness in it. You can relax in it. And He made the day full of, or easy for you to see in, so you can move around and, and go about your business. Now, this is the allegory that I've been trying to allude to, but let's go to the text itself and see what's been said by the Mufassirun. وَالضُّحَى هُنَا يُمَثِّلُ نُورَ الْوَحْيِ وَإِشْرَاقِهِ The soothing light represents the light of revelation and the brilliance that it had on the Messenger وسلم, and how he was able to deliver that brilliance to others. كَمَا قَالَ الْمُفَسِّرُونَ As the Mufassirun have said. وَاللَّيْلُ يُمَثِّلُ الْقِطَاعَ الْوَحْيِ وَسُكُونُهُ وَسُكُونِهِ rather. He says that the night represents the discontinuation, the cutting off of revelation when the revelation stopped coming, and its stillness. What dunya beautiful, he says, as al he says, what dunya min ghayri nuh al wahi dhalam. This world without the light of revelation would be in darkness. Without the light of revelation, it would be in darkness. وَلِذَلِكَ قَدَّمَ سُبْحَانَهُ الضُّحَى هُنَا SubhanAllah, how amazing the Qur'an. He says, how come Allah mentioned the morning first and the night second? He's describing from a, from a literary point of view, how come Allah begins with duha and then goes to layl? How come He didn't begin with layl and then went to duha? Well, revelation started coming first and then it was discontinued. So the morning is mentioned first because that represents what? The revelation coming down, the soothing morning, soothing light. And then it stopped coming and that is like the night when it became still. So that, that sequence 
of the events in the life of the Prophet ﷺ is captured in وَالضُّحَى وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى Because you know somebody from a skeptic mind can come around and say, well, how come the previous surah said وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَى وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَى Light, night first, day second. This surah should also be night first, day second. But it's contrasted because it fits this context better, subhanAllah. So, مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى now Allah Azza wa Jal gets to the point. Remember we said the mushrikun had said, Oh, your Lord, your master abandoned you. He left you. Actually, some of Fasirun disagree. Some of Fasirun say this is not an authentic narration. And perhaps this is a feeling that the messenger had without even the commentary of any mushrikun. He felt this in and of himself. Maybe Allah is displeased. Let's look at the language Allah Azza wa Jal used. Ma wadda'aka. Let's explore the words first. At-tawdi' in Arabic is to say farewell. But that's the original word is al-wida'ah, which some Urdu speakers are used to, al-wida'ah kana, right? Al-wida'ah in Arabic is to say goodbye. But at-tawdi'ah is yadulu al mufariq it's like final goodbye or never coming back. Okay, like goodbye at the airport, one-way ticket, that's at-tawdi'ah. But goodbye at work, because you're going to see the guy the next day, if Allah wills, is al-wida'ah. There's a difference between the two. Now Allah uses a tawdi'ah, there's shad on, wadda'aka. By the majority of the Qur'an, they recite, not wadda'aka, but wadda'aka. So Allah is saying, Allah has not permanently bid you farewell. Allah has not said goodbye to you forever. Now, before we go any further, there are different ways of saying this in Arabic. You could say, lam yuwadda'aka. He didn't, in the translation would say, he didn't bid you farewell. But we don't find this in the Qur'an, we find ma wadda'aka. The use of the word ma is important to note. Ma in negation, ma is, you know, to, to, to say a sentence and make it negative in the past tense. But its benefit is to actually emphatically declare it. For example, just to make the matter simpler, simple, if I say, Lam yuwadda'aka, he didn't bid you farewell. He didn't say farewell to you. Ma wadda'aka, he didn't bid you farewell at all. That's not the case at all. He's going beyond just saying that, to actually convincing the Messenger ﷺ because this use of ma illustrates that the audience that you're speaking to are skeptical or unsure. So it actually alludes to the unsure state of the heart of the Messenger ﷺ who wasn't sure if Allah is happy with him or not. So Allah is giving him absolute certainty Allah is not at all and has not at all been displeased with you just by the use of the word ma here. That ma in and of itself is an expression of Allah's love for his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam the other thing that's really beautiful is that you know the bidding of the bidding of farewell this at-tawdi' yakun bayn al-mutahabbin hadha min haythu al-lugha this bidding of farewell at-tawdi' is not used when enemies say goodbye to each other it is only used when two people that love each other friends family when they say goodbye to each other and this is an emotional thing and this is a thing that's full of honor and, and respect and love, that's when tawdi'ah is used. So first of all, the, love, the word in and of itself has love for the Messenger ﷺ. Even though it's bidding farewell. So Allah you know, could have said, مَا تَرَكَكْ Your Lord didn't abandon you. He, could have said, he didn't say that. He said, forget abandoning, He didn't even lovingly say goodbye to you. He didn't even do that much. He's not left you at all. Now, the word... For Allah used here is Rabbuka. Allah does not say, Ma wadda'aka Allahu. Allah did not bid you farewell at all. He says, Your master did not bid you farewell. Fahuwa Rabbuk. Fakayfa yuwadda'uk. Right? He's your master. He's the one who gives you gifts, who takes full control of your affairs, who's in charge of you. Why would he say farewell to you? So, in the use of the word Rabbuka, your master. He's your master. Why would he say farewell to you? The, just the use of the word Rabbuka in and of itself again has love for the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ Not Rabbu samawati wal ard not Allah, Al-Khaliq, no other name, Rabbuka. This in and of itself is an expression of Allah's love. And again, to say farewell to others in Arabic, as we find in the Qur'an, you could say عَذَرَ وَذَرَ تَرَكَ خَلَّ هَجَرَ There are different words you can use to bid farewell. But the perfect choice of word to say, even in the most loving sense, Allah has not left you or abandoned you. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next word is wama qala. Wama qala. And he is not displeased at all. 
he is not at all displeased. Now let's explore the meaning of the word qala first before we discuss some of its, you know, its implication. Al-qala in Arabic is when you are unhappy with someone and as a result you discontinue communication with them. You're unhappy with what someone did and as a result you're not continuing to communicate with them anymore. Now the amazing thing is the word qala is called what we call in Arabic al-muta'addi. It's a transitive verb. What that means is you don't just say he's not he's displeased, you say he's displeased with you. Like in English you don't just say for example you can't just say I or you could kind of say I ate, but you're expected to say I ate. It's time for the adhan? It's time? Okay. So we'll inshallah ta'ala discuss the ayah wa ma qala that part of it after the salah subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashadu an la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Barakallahu feekum. To download more lectures, learn more about our project, and to help support it, visit www.bayyina.com slash dream. That's B-A-Y-Y-I-N-A-H slash dream. You are free to share these recordings with family and friends. Thank you and Jazakumullah Khairan for helping us make our dream a reality. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته كنا نقرأ ما ودعك ربك وما قلا we were reciting ما ودعك ربك وما قلا and we talked about how Allah عز وجل lets his messenger know he didn't bid you permanent farewell at all one subtle point I didn't I failed to mention before, the oaths that Allah Azza wa took in the beginning were about the, the morning and the evening, neither of which are permanent. So it's only fitting that Allah says the farewell, the gap in revelation is not permanent. مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى Now to the, the word qala we were talking about, and I was just in the middle of explaining that it's transitive. What that simply means is it needs an object. In other words, you don't say, I am unhappy, you have to say, I am unhappy with, and you mention somebody, right? So you say, you don't say, I bid farewell. You say, I bid you farewell. Similarly, if I say, I am displeased, you would expect in Arabic at least, I am displeased with you. So that you would be mentioned again. Now, when it came to bidding farewell, Allah Azza wa Jal says, ma wadda'a ka. That ka is, means you. It's referring to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa your Lord did not bid you farewell at all, bid you farewell at all. But when it came to being displeased, Allah does not say, وَمَا قَلَا ka, And He is not displeased with you. The word you, the ka is not there, it's just qala. It's just qala, okay? Now, bidding farewell, yakun bayna al mutahabbin. Bidding farewell happens between people who love each other, or two parties that love each other. But being displeased, it could happen between people that are at odds against each other. So the word that could have even, that might have suggested that Allah may be displeased with His Messenger, in that context, Allah did not even put the Messenger's name. He did not even mention you. With, with goodbye, it's not a negative term. So Allah's Messenger's name is mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa ma wadda'a ka. With being displeased, Allah put the name, He removed the name of the Messenger, or the mention of the Messenger wasallam. He said, He's not displeased. But He refrained from saying, He is not displeased with you. This is one benefit. Ikram al-Rasul al-Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This, um, as we say, فَلَمْ يَذْكُرِ الْمَفْعُولِ إِكْرَامَ لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ He didn't mention the object, meaning He didn't mention the Messenger, out of honor of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But there are other benefits. When in Arabic something is expected and not mentioned, its benefits are multi, multiple. One, it could be, as we said, for honor, but it could be to actually include a number of meanings at one time. And this is, you know, this at-tawassu' fil ma'na it's called, to expand the meaning. And so by saying Allah is not displeased, He's teaching us, not only is He not displeased with you, but not any of your followers either. He's not displeased with anything that has to do with your mission. He's happy with all everybody altogether. 
So this qala, leaving it open, it opens the scope of it. Not, neither you nor your followers have done anything wrong. You have nothing, there's nothing blameworthy going on. This is just a necessary part of the process. And by taking an oath, by the, the soothing morning and the night, what do you expect after the night? Morning again. We're learning here that the revelation when it used to come to the Messenger wasallam, it was like life for him. It was like that beautiful morning for him. And when the revelation stopped coming, it was like that dead, still night that's not moving. It seems like death. It seems like it's never gonna go away. It was that endless depression for the Messenger wasallam. But Allah gives him hope. Now, وَلَلْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى Just incredibly beautiful words. And we're gonna see this lesson, what we're learning here, وَلَلْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى This lesson will keep coming back as the surahs continue from here to the end of Qur'an. In different wordings. But let's talk about these words first and foremost. وَلَلْآخِرَةُ Typically in Arabic we just say, وَلْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ The hereafter is better. But Allah says, really the hereafter is better. Lal akhirah. The extra la in akhirah is lam at tawkid. Now this is used in Arabic in two ways. One way it's used is to swear. I swear the next life is better. Allah is saying, I swear the next life is better. Or He's saying, I swear for, for sure the next life is better. Now that kind of language is used depending on the audience. Now, just to give you some idea of what I'm talking about from a, from a rhetorical point of view. When I say the teacher is sitting, then I'm talking to an audience that is neutral. If I say the teacher is definitely sitting, you know what that suggests? That suggests the people I'm talking to, they're not so sure about if he's sitting or not. So I have to convince them. So I don't just say the teacher is sitting, I say the teacher is definitely sitting. But then there's a group of people who says the teacher is standing for sure. To talk to them I have to say, I swear the teacher is definitely sitting. My language changes. Because the audience is denying what I have to say, right? So the strength of the language suggests the state of the audience. That's what it suggests. Your child will say to you, I swear I didn't do it. Because they see on your face that you're convinced that you did it. That's why they, 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 you have to use that sort of tone. Now Allah says, وَلَلْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ The hereafter is definitely, definitely better for you. It's better for you. And we'll get to the you part. مِنَ الْأُولَى From the earliest, from the former. So the, the latter is better for you than the former. Now this has been interpreted in two ways. One group of Mufassirun says, the latter refers to the Akhirah, refers literally to the Akhirah. Jannah is better for you. The Hawd in Jannah, Al-Kawthar is better for you than what you have here. Others say, no, it's the latter part of the Prophet's struggle wasallam, that is going to be better for him than the earlier part. In, the, in other words, it's going to be easier on him. It's going to be what Allah, the, the challenges ahead are going to be easier. It's the hardest part's already over. The toughest part is already done. Now you would think, how can that be? We have to address this issue. How can it be that the toughest part is already done? This is Makkah and Quran. Hijra hasn't happened yet. The torture hasn't occurred yet. Right? The ultimate humiliations haven't occurred. Badr hasn't happened. Uhud hasn't happened. Ahzab hasn't happened. The trouble of the munafiqun hasn't occurred. None of these trials have occurred, and yet Allah is saying what is coming is what? Is better than the earliest. What this is referring to is a very strong lesson in the seerah and the struggle of the Prophet ﷺ. The toughest struggle is the earliest part of the seerah of the Messenger ﷺ, and it's a psychological challenge. He's the only one. Everybody calls him crazy. When he speaks, people ridicule. People make mockery. And whoever believes in him gets called crazy too. You know, as time progresses, more and more people believe. And if when more of your, when more of us are in a group, we have support. But if there's only one or two, then it's it's that much harder to open your mouth. You know, if we're in an audience, a hundred of us, five hundred of us, and something is said about Islam, we can find the courage to stand up and say, "No, that's not true." But if there's a thousand opponents and there's one of us. It's harder to open your mouth. It's more difficult. So Allah Azza wa Jalla is suggesting that your numbers are going to increase. And the way the da'wah will become easier and easier upon you. And this ridicule will become more and more, it will become less and less relevant. So it's the internal struggle that will become easier. The external struggles will remain difficult. And Allah Azza wa Jalla will make them easy for you as well. SubhanAllah. The other thing is I said, 
you know, some people believe the akhirah here referring to the next life, other referring to, other saying, referring to the latter time of the Prophet's life, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. How does Allah in His language, in His Quran, ensure that we appreciate both meanings? If Allah said, "Wala al-akhiratu khairul laka min al-dunya," dunya, dunya is this world, akhirah is the next world. But Allah, instead of using dunya, what did He use here? Al-ula. The earlier, the former, which again at tawassu' fil ma'na. It includes, by saying earlier, it could mean dunya, and it could mean the earlier part of the Prophet's life. So both meanings are captured together, subhanAllah. The Messenger's struggles as he continues will be better for him, and the Messenger's life in the hereafter, of course, will be better for him. But there's one more thing here that makes it clear that this is not talking first about the akhirah, even though that meaning is included, it's talking about something special first. وَلَا الْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ The hereafter or the latter part is better for you. It's better for you. Now we know akhirah is better than the next, this, the, the next life is better than this life. That is for sure. But Allah especially highlights لَكَ Not even للمؤمنين The next life is better for the believers than this life. No, for you especially sallallahu alayhi wa How is this to be understood? First of all, we learn what he will get in akhirah, nobody else will get. Maqam and Mahmuda, right? Al Kawthar. So he gets things that nobody else gets. So it, it, it's especially better for him. And then what this says suggests is Allah will give him khair in this dunya that has never been given to anyone before him. There are people in this world that have all kinds of riches, they have all kinds of wealth. But the khair Allah will give him, not just in akhirah, but in this dunya. The khair, the good Allah will give his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa in this dunya is unlike any khayr that has ever been given before. Let's, let's count some of those khayr. The domination of Islam, the victory of Islam Allah will give in this world. The conquest and the cleansing of the house of Allah that will become the center of the worship of Allah for generations, thousands of years to come. People will worship you know, Allah at, at directing their face in that house and Allah will give him the honor of cleansing that house. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, you know, how is it that as the generations continue, it's better for the messenger even in the worldly sense? Everywhere in the world, the adhan is called, and whenever the adhan is called, we elevate his mention. وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ أَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ الرَّسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ his, his, his status keeps on getting elevated. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And every time, you know, we say we should do good things because it's sadaqah jariyah. Isn't that what we say? We should do good things, we should contribute to the masjid, we should help out with the, you know, give to the orphan and support the school and make, you know, help people memorize the Qur'an, things like that. Because the good will continue after. The good will continue after. Teaching is a kind of sadaqa jariya. Giving, you know, giving zakat and all these kinds of things, sadaqa jariya. Who did the most sadaqa jariya? Think about that. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Every time someone does something good, they are emulating in a, in a, a thousandth of a fraction the practice of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa So the more good the Sahaba do, who's actually racking up the rewards? وَلَلْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى وَلَلْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى Subhanallah. So, أَنَّ مَا يَأْتِي خَيْرٌ لَكَ أَيُّهَا الرَّسُولُ مِمَّا مَضَى As Asayim al-Ra'i comments, that what's coming is better for you, O Messenger, than what has already passed. So we learn why not mention dunya. Wal al-akhiratu khairu laka min al-dunya, because then the meaning of akhira would be reduced to the next life. By saying ula, the akhira refers to the next life and the later struggles of the messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The other thing about laka, again, we said in this surah we'll find many many things that tell you the special love Allah has for His messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He took ka away from qala ka, but when it came to khair, he said khairun la. Ka, he brought ka back again. <laughs> Additional ka, that you don't expect. The sentence would be complete, complete without the prepositional phrase. You could say, وَلَا الْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ مِّنَ الْأُولَى The hereafter is better than this, the, the, for, the later is better than the earlier. But he says, the later is better for you. The eventual is better for you than the earlier. SubhanAllah. And by the way, if you, when you look at the rest of this surah, how beautifully the surah is tied together, we're skipping one ayah, but Allah mentions the Messenger والسلام, used to be an orphan. And he was given shelter. Then he used to be in search of guidance, and Allah guided him. Then he used to be, you know, in need and in, de- in a desperate situation, and Allah made him free of need. Ailan fa'aghna, right? Now here he says the the latter part is better for you than the earlier part. 
And then Allah is teaching His Messenger وسلم, that you already have experience of this. You already have experience of the latter situation being better than the former situation. You were an orphan and later on you got shelter. You were looking for guidance, later on you got guidance. You were in a desperate financial situation, Allah made you ghani. So already the proof is there in the rest of the surah. It's almost a tafsir of wal akhiratu khairun laka min al-ulis. Beautiful how it's tied together, subhanAllah. But now let's get to this next ayah. وَلَا سَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى وَلَا سَوْفَ Now first of all, the word la. Again, la al-akhira, la sawfa. When Allah is talking about the future, He's emphasizing, emphasizing, emphasizing. Why? As the struggles get more and more difficult in the work of the Messenger wasallam, in His work of da'wah, the more you have to emphasize, why are you doing this struggle to begin with? And the promise of victory in the, in the future. The promise of paradise in the future. So now how does Allah give consolation to His Messenger? By saying la. Now, in Arabic for ref- reference to the future, you could say sa or sawfa. You could say la sa yu'tika, or you could say la sawfa yu'tika. So you could say sa and sawfa. You could say, for example, sawfa usalli, and you could say sa usalli. Both of them in rough translation would be, I will pray. I will pray. Or you could even add, I will pray soon. But the difference between sa and sawfa is subtle. Sofa is a long, it's farther away than sa. Sofa is longer away than sa. So, for example, if I say sofa usalli for the ancient Arab, you're going to be praying a little later. But sa usalli, you'll be praying a little sooner. Allah says, "Wala sofa yu'tika." Allah will soon give you, but not too soon. It's a little bit later on. Meaning, the messenger is being told, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, until you get there, there's things to do in the meantime. You have some time before you finally get the eventual gifts. Right now there's some time in between. If it was going to happen very very soon, what would we, what we have found? وَلَا سَيُعْطِيكَ Or وَسَيُعْطِيكَ But so far, there's time in the middle. Now that time in the middle, how should it be spent? We're gonna get instructions later on in the surah too. Now that that time in the middle has been uh, illustrated. But let's talk a little bit about this, the word يُعْطِيكَ Allah will give. Allah will give you. I'm just roughly translating right now. Allah will give you. But then when you say, I'm going to give you, if you say to your child, I'll give you, what does your child ask you back? Give me what? Give me what? Right? Now the ayah is already said, give you when? Soon I will give you. Soon, a little bit later, I will give you. Okay. But give you what? Allah does not mention what He will give. And this removal of the object, this is again, Allah doesn't say, يُعْطِيكَ الْكَوْثَرْ إِنَّا أَعْطَيْنَاكَ الْكَوْثَرْ He mentioned kawthar, what He will give, He mentioned. But in this surah, he didn't even mention what he will give. He didn't even mention what he will give. The benefit of that is, لَقَدْ أَطْلَقَ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَىٰ الْعِطَاءِ وَلَمْ يُحَدِّدْهُ He made the giving absolute and didn't put any limits on it. He, did, he made the, I'll give you. Now you know, imagine somebody comes to you and says, I'll take care of you. Somebody really, really, really rich comes to you and says, I'm going to give you so much, you'll be happy. Are you, are you thinking you're going to get 25 bucks out of this guy? You're thinking you're going to get paid. Because he didn't even put a number and he said, you'll be happy, trust me. I'll take care of you. Right? Now, so what, what the Arab says is, Al-Ita'u ala qadr al-mu'ti. Giving is appropriate to the one who is going to give. So when Allah says, I'll give you. You can imagine, he didn't even put a limit on it, how unlimited the reward is for the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yu'tika. The other thing is Allah does not say wala wala sawfa yu'tika. Ata yu'ti in Arabic is to give. A'ta yu'ti is also to give. The difference between them came up in the previous surah when we said fa amma man a'ta wa taqa a'ta the the one who gave. And then later on in that surah we saw alladhi yu'ti malahu not yu'ti but yu'ti malahu. We talked about the difference between these two as a reminder. Ata ata is to give. A'ta is to give a lot. So Allah, even the word for giving is a lot to begin with. And then Allah didn't put a limit on it on top of that. And the other amazing thing about ita is, you know there's a kind of giving that you can take back also? Right, you can give and you can take it back. Then you can use the word ita. For example, yu'ti mulkahu. Tu'ti, right? Tu'ti, wa tanzi'u. You give and you take away. Allah uses this in Quran. Tu'ti mulka man tasha, wa tanzi'u mulka min man tasha. You give 
rulership and, and sovereignty to whoever you want and you take it away. You snatch it whenever you want or from whoever you want. But yu'ti, the ain ta, this word, when you give, you've given. You don't take it back. So the word that is used is so beautiful for his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let's look at how this word has been used in other places. By the way, when i'ta is done, then you don't have, you have full rights over what has been given. When ita is done, it might come with responsibility. Like, آتَيْنَاكِ kitab, Allah gave the book. Does the book come with responsibilities? Or you can do whatever you want with the book. It comes with responsibilities. But Allah says, Allah gave His Messenger al-kawthar. آتَيْنَاكِ kawthar. أَعْطَى Which means He has full rights over kawthar. Allah gave Him full rights over al-kawthar. Similarly, we find when um, Sulaiman alayhi salam has been talked about, هَذَا عَطَاؤُنَا فَمْنٌ أَوْ أَمْسِكْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ أَوْ أَمْسِكْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ This is our gift to you, then favor others or hold back however you want without any limits. You have full rights. The word used, إِعْطَى عَطَاؤُنَا عَطَاؤُنَا So this gives you full control. That is the word Allah uses for His Messenger wasallam. I'm going to give you no strings attached. No responsibilities. It's a gift to you, subhanAllah. فَلَا سَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ Now there's a discussion pages upon pages upon pages in tafsir, on what is it that Allah will give. And most of the discussion revolves around Allah Azza wa Jal giving and the Messenger asking for the shafa'ah, for the intercession of this ummah. And Allah Azza wa Jal will accept the plea of His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until the Messenger says, I am satisfied. I am satisfied. So the words are, وَلَسَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى Then you will be pleased. You will be pleased. Who's, who will be pleased? Then as a result, the Messenger will be pleased sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's beautiful subtlety here. Again, at tawassu' fil ma'na. First of all, Allah will forgive and give shafa'a until the Messenger himself sallallahu alayhi wa is satisfied. We should understand this holistically. Some of the Muslims have taken the shafa'a of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and taken advantage of this concept and said, well I can run the liquor store, because after all Allah loves His Messenger. And He's gonna make a case for me and I'll be alright. Right? They've taken advantage of this concept of a shafa'a min al-Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa But we understand in the Qur'an, Allah makes two kinds of testimony. Allah's Messenger makes two kinds of requests. On the one hand, he makes a request for shafa'ah. We find this in plenty of a hadith. And in the words, illa bi idnihi, right? On the other hand, we find the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam making a case, complaining to Allah about a group of people. Now I want you to think about this with a, with a sound heart. On the one hand, Allah is making a case for some people. Oh Allah, forgive them. They are my ummah. On the other hand, that same Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is making a case complaining to Allah in the court of Allah against a group of people. Now you can imagine, Allah will satisfy the request of His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Who He makes a case for, and who He makes a case against. If Allah's Messenger complains against Him, who's gonna come and be a defense attorney for that guy? You understand? This is a scary place to be. Now, what are the words? Allah's Messenger says in another place, وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا The Messenger will say, Master, O oh, oh Lord, O oh Master, this nation of mine, my nation, no doubt, abandoned this Qur'an. They abandoned this Qur'an. This is referring to the kuffar who abandoned the message of the Qur'an. But Allah Azza wa does not make the Messenger say on that day, إِنَّ الْكُفَّارِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا the disbelievers, they took, they abandoned the Qur'an. He says, inna qawmi, my nation abandoned the Qur'an. Now his nation is Quraysh originally, but who else is included in his nation? We are. So if we abandon the book of Allah and its message and its teachings, its guidance, its application, then we might, the danger exists. Because the description fits, the label wasn't given, the description was given. And if it fits, it's a scary scenario. May Allah not make us or any of the Muslims from those unfortunate that the Messenger himself sallallahu alayhi wa sallam complains against. You know this fatarda, fatarda, this, the word rida, to be satisfied, this is used usually in Jannah. رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوا عَنْهُ فَهُوَ فِي عِيشَةٍ رَاضِيَةٍ اِرْجِعِي إِلَىٰ رَبِّكِ رَاضِيَةً مَرْضِيَةً These are context of Jannah when rida is used. 
Allah says to His Messenger, He will give you so much that you will be, you will have ridha, you will be satisfied, you will be totally content. But again, an object is not mentioned. When you say He will be pleased, He will be satisfied, two questions come up. Pleased with who? And pleased about what? You know, pleased with who? And pleased about what? Now the answer to that is, pleased with who? Pleased with Allah. Now the thing is, no matter what Allah Azza wa does, whether Allah punishes the Ummah or doesn't punish the Ummah, the Messenger will always be pleased with Allah. That's given. But Allah Azza wa did not just say, فَتَرْضَى عَنِّي فَتَرْضَى عَنْ رَبِّكْ You will be pleased with your Lord. He said, you will be pleased, just pleased. Not only will he be pleased with his Master, he will also be pleased with what his Master has done. Over what? The forgiveness, the shifa'ah the shifa that has been offered to the ummah, and the gifts that Allah has given His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah make us all recipients of that. Now Allah says, Alam yajidka yatiman? Amazing rhetorical language. Alam yajidka yatiman? Didn't He find you an orphan? Didn't Allah, didn't He find you an orphan? Now the, the language, you could have said, wa, wajad, Wajadaka yatiman? He found you an orphan. Allah says, didn't he find you an orphan? He puts it as a question, as a rhetorical question. Now when do we do that in language? It's very simple. It was done thousands of years ago, it's even done today. You say to somebody, didn't I do this? Didn't I take care of you last time? Somebody says, hey, are you going to deliver on time this week? And your business partner, you say to him, didn't I do this last time too? Didn't we already have this conversation? What are you trying to say? Don't worry about it. It's taken care of. I'm reliable and I've proven my reliability to you already. So now the Messenger is concerned sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the fate of the ummah, about whether this mission will succeed or not, about whether or not more revelation will come, and Allah azza wa jal gives him consolation by not referring to the future now, referring to the past. The few gifts that Allah just talked about so far were about the future. Allah will give, He will not abandon you, He's not displeased with you, that's about the future. Now He turns the subject matter to the past making the same case from the past. Didn't he find you an orphan? فَآوَى Al-Iwa in Arabic, awa is, is thulathi mujarrad, those of you who know a little bit about sarf and morphology, the three letter form of it is to give or take refuge from some kind of danger. But Iwa is to pull, bring someone into your home, to make someone a guest in your house because they have nowhere to stay. You put them in your house, this is called Al-Iwa. Allah says, didn't he find you an orphan and he made you a guest? He gave you iwa. Now we know, we know, Allah Azza wa Jal gave him this or this shelter by means of his uncle Abu Talib radiallahu, or not radiallahu but you know, his uncle Abu Talib, who had given him shelter when he was an orphan. But Allah does not mention, I gave you this shelter by means of Abu Talib, by this, by this, by this. Who takes full credit for the, for the giving of shelter? Awa, he gave shelter. What do we understand from this? We understand people will do us favors. But we have to recognize those are just means. Where did the favor actually come from? It came from Allah Azza wa Jal. Didn't He find you an orphan? By the way, yatim is an important... Yatim has been coming up, if you notice in the previous surah. Yatim keeps coming up. Take care of the yatim, take care of yatim. And now, you yourself were yatim. You yourself were yatim. The Messenger is being told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why the yatim? so much mention of the yatim? If you think of a child who's been orphaned, it's the most painful thing to imagine a child losing their parents. By not having their parents anymore. Nobody cares for you like your parents care for you. Even if somebody adopts you, even if it's your uncle, even if it's your relative, no one will ever substitute for your parents. The way they love you, the way they forgive you, the way they overlook your shortcomings, nobody else does that for you. And if you don't have any shelter after your parents are gone, then you are basically the most oppressed in society and nobody hears your cries. The orphan, who's he gonna cry to? Who's he gonna complain to? Your child cries, you run and take care of them. But if we, if you know, our children, ma'ad Allah, if a child is orphaned, who's gonna take care of their cries? Who's gonna fulfill their needs? Who's gonna give them, who's gonna hug them, who's gonna put them to sleep? They don't, they, it's not just a loss of food and shelter. It's that human need to be taken care of that's taken away from them, right? So Allah says, you were in this helpless state. You were in this dark place and Allah Azza wa Jal brought you out. So, وَلَا الْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى The case is already proven in the past. فَآوَى Then he says, وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًا فَهَدَى Very important ayah. If you look at the word ضَال, it means mis, you know, misled. Misled. It also means lost. 
So the raw translation would be, and he found you lost, then he guided you. Now when we say the people outside on the street are lost, they're going to the clubs, they're drinking, they're doing this, that, they're lost. We say about the Christians, they're lost, they do shirk. غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ Same word, وَلَضَّالِّينَ It is used for people, we don't want to be like them. And in this ayah, Allah is using it for His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa We have to understand this carefully. Similarly, Musa alayhi salam, when he was questioned by Fir'aun, وَفَعَلْتَ فَعْلَتَكَ الَّتِي فَعَلْتَ وَأَنْتَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ You did that thing you did, you know, you killed that guy. Are you denying it? What did he say? فَعَلْتُهَا إِذَنْ وَأَنَا مِنَ الضَّالِّينَ I did it, but I was from those who were lost. So how do we understand this word? The way it's been explained, by the way, there are, the, the explanation of this comes from the Qur'an itself. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَإِن كُنْتَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ And before this revelation came, you were unaware. You were utterly unaware that there's this higher truth, this wisdom, that could only have come from Allah, you can't figure it out yourself. You were completely unaware of it. And comparing your state after the revelation came to before the revelation came, you can only be described as what? Lost. But even his lost state is better than most of us today. <laughs> right? He never committed shirk. He was on the fitrah. And when the scholars describe the fitrah of, of, of the prophets, especially, alayhim salam, they don't commit shirk, they don't commit any evil acts, they are the best and most, most righteous of people. Even, in, even before the revelation comes, they have all the elements of the best of, a, of the believers. They already have all of that. But the highest wisdom, the highest wisdom, what exactly do we have to do for our master? How do we call him? What pleases him? What displeases him? What do we owe him? That we are lost. At that point, we are lost. So you can have a decent person, but if you have someone, you know, even a decent person doesn't know everything about what they owe to their, their creator, in that sense he was lost, and some actually even better define it, he was seeking. He found you seeking. You know, when somebody is lost, what are they doing? They're seeking. So the implication is, he found you searching for truth. In other words, as Islahi comments in Tadabur al-Qur'an, he says at this point, the Messenger wasallam is raised in a society where people do shirk. It doesn't fit his taste. He can't, he can't stand shirk. He doesn't go and be part of useless gatherings. The people of the book have corrupted their books, even that doesn't satisfy him. So he is disturbed about where do, where do you find truth? He's seeking desperately for it. And it is at that desperate moment that... And you know, some even comment that the fact that he used to go reflect in the cave, and he used to leave society even before revelation came, it is because he was so dissatisfied with what was there. There was nothing there that satisfied his quest for truth. So he would go and reflect and reflect and reflect, but the human mind cannot find that truth on its own. So Allah, Allah describes that state of the Messenger searching sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and He gives it fahada. And this is essentially, if you want to look at it from an outsider's point of view, this is essentially the difference between a philosopher and a prophet. This is essentially the difference between a philosopher and a prophet. Aristotle, Plato, all these philosophers, right? Where did they find truth? They found the truth from reflection, their own thoughts. Where does the messenger find truth? He reflects, he realizes he can't find truth on his own, and then Allah gives him guidance. So his wisdom is not his own. The wisdom is given to him by Allah. وَمَنْ يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Whoever has been given wisdom. They don't have wisdom, Allah gives them wisdom. Allah gives them wisdom. Even Luqman, we don't say Al-Hakim actually. We say, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ We gave Luqman wisdom. Allah doesn't say Luqman was wise. Allah says Allah gave him wisdom. So this is really the quest, the, the messenger is significantly different from the philosopher. Now the, the Western mind, when they, when they talk about prophets, especially in Islam, they say, oh your Muhammad says. That's how they talk about him. Muhammad, Muhammad said this, Muhammad said that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They don't say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But they are assuming that he is what? That he's a philosopher. They're making the assumption that he said this, this was his own ideas. But where are we coming from? Allah guided him. Allah gave him this. He doesn't speak on his behalf. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ so This is the essential difference. So now Allah explains in His own book, وَمَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابِ وَلَا الْإِيمَانِ You had no idea what the book was, and you had no idea what complete iman was. You had no idea. Allah gave you that guidance. Similarly, Musa didn't know the law of Allah, 
when he committed that crime, he didn't know. He didn't know any better. So in that sense, he was lost. Not like the lost of, you know, al-maghdub alayhim and al-dalim. This is the one seeking the truth. And Allah gave you that ultimate gift, fahada. Wa wajadaka a'ilan. And he found you in ila. Aila or ila also. Okay? Now this word, you know, it's translated as poor. Or desperate, financially desperate. But the Quran uses the word faqir, miskeen. For poverty, Allah uses the word imlaq, qatr, ba'sa, matraba, yatiman, or miskeenan dha matraba, we learned, right? One with the dust. All these words are used for poverty. What word has been used here? Ailan. Ail is someone who is under a lot of pressure and they're being crushed by that pressure. A term for your family is ayal in Arabic. Ayal. You know why that word is used? If you are financially responsible for your family members, it is like a burden placed upon you. So they're called ayal. Okay? Ail is someone who is under a lot of pressure, a lot of burden is on them, and you have to alleviate that burden. Allah says, وَوَجَدَكَ عَائِلًا فَأَغْنَى He found you crushed under weight, in, in this desperate state, and He made you free of need. فَأَغْنَى Now Allah Azza wa does not mention how He made him ghani. You know, we learn in tafsir of this surah, he, may, he married him, he found him a spouse, Khadija radiallahu anha, who was financially free. This freed up the time of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa so he may reflect and he may do other things. And the, the financial support of Khadija radiallahu anha plays a strategic role in the, in the struggle of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa But in the end, the credit does not go, as much as she gets rewarded radiallahu anha, where does the credit go? Where does Allah take, who takes the credit? Aghna. He takes the, He made you free of need. And as I reminded you in the beginning of this dars, it is being compared with the previous surah. وَمَا يُغْنِي عَنْهُ مَالُهُ إِذَا تَرَدَّ His wealth is not able to make him free of need. In the previous surah, your wealth is not enough to make you free of need. And in this surah, Allah makes you free of need. Allah makes His Messenger free of need. This comparison is being drawn. SubhanAllah. فَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرْ Now Allah gave His Messenger وسلم, three reminders. Three favors that Allah had done for him. What were the three favors? أَلَمْ يَجِدْكَ يَتِيمًا Didn't He find you an orphan? Didn't He find you seeking? وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًا And then finally, وَوَجَدَكَ عَائِلًا Three favors. Three favors. Now Allah places on His Messenger symmetrically three demands. Three favors were mentioned. Now three demands are going to be mentioned. فَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ then when it comes to the orphan, especially, أَمَّا yatim would imply, then especially when it comes to the orphan, فَلَا تَقْهَرْ Then don't overpower him, don't humiliate him. This is, you know, فَلَا تَغْلَبْ or تَغْلِبْ even, don't over-dominate him, don't be domineering to an orphan. But تَقْهَرْ قَهَرْ is different from, from غَلَبْ okay? قَهَرْ is to not only have power over someone, but to impose yourself on them and then humiliate them too. These are all the implications of the word taqhar. Why does Allah mention this? Of course the Messenger would never do this sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But when the Messenger is being taught directly, who is supposed to be learning? All of us. We are supposed to be learning. Allah is teaching His Messenger a lesson, but we're supposed to take heed. So, فَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرْ Because you yourself were yatim at once, at, at one time. So you are here to make sure that this doesn't happen to any yatim. وَأَمَّا السَّائِلَ فَلَا تَنْهَرْ and when it comes to the, the one who asks, now the one who asks could be two things. They could be asking you for knowledge, they could be asking you for guidance, and of course they could be hungry. Not just hungry of knowledge and guidance, but hungry really of food, of shelter. So if any sa'il comes to you, then as far as they're concerned, فَلَا تَنْهَرْ Then you don't, you know, it's interesting, you guys know the word nahar, river, right? تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا anhar. So what's tanhar? What's nahar have to do with nahar? Nahar really, if you translate it, don't scold him. That's how it's translated, don't scold him. Now the Arabic word for that is zajar. فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ زَجْرَةٌ wahida. Right? وَزْدُجِر For example. These are, this is scolding. But nahar, you know, it's a river in which the water is gushing. And this word is used for scolding, that when you're yelling at somebody and scolding them, they feel like they're standing in a river and the water is gushing at them. It's, it's like they're standing and facing the wrath of a river. That's what it feels like when you're humiliating them and yelling at them. So Allah says, when someone comes and asks you, don't humiliate them like that so they feel like they're standing in a river. And they're being, the water's just coming and, and just hitting them wave after wave after wave. 
What we're learning here is how to deal with the one who asks. And you know, especially for the people of knowledge or da'wah and things like that, sometimes people ask really annoying questions. Right? And some, sometimes people ask really like, uh, uh, you know, absurd kinds of questions. And you look at them and you say, how, how dumb are you? Why don't you get this? It's simple, you know, and they'll, you answered it, then they ask again. Then you answer for 20 minutes and they ask somebody else, ask the same question again. And you say, oh my God, I can't stand these people. They have such annoying questions, <laughs> right? Or somebody asks to, get, to get, get on your nerves. Sometimes somebody can ask to get on your nerves. And you figure you've sized this guy up, he's only asking to kind of, you know, size you up. Even then, leave them in a dignified fashion. You don't say, I'm gonna teach this guy a lesson. lesson. I'm gonna make him face the wrath of a river. <laughs> Right? Give, Allah gives the advice, a masail fala tanhar. Don't don't humiliate them like that. Don't humiliate them like that. And this is the, the advice given to the messenger himself. So how much more does it apply upon us, uh, uh, all of ourselves? But the last thing, Subhanahu wa Taala, he says to his messenger, wa amma bi ni'mati rabbik. And as when it comes to the favor of your master, ni'ma, ni'ma comes from nu'uma, softness. As for the softness and the ease and the relaxation and the comfort that the Master has given you, ni'mati rabbik, fahaddith, then make mention of it. Now the thing is, Allah did not mention which ni'mah. Before He said, يُعْطِيكَ, He will give you. He didn't mention what He'll give you. Here He said, make mention of the ni'mah, not even ni'am. Ni'am would have been all of the favors. Allah just says, one ni'mah, ni'mah, ni'mati rabbik. And the other thing also is, in, in language you could say, فَأَمَّا بِالنِّعْمَةِ مِنْ رَبِّكْ As for the favor that came from your Lord. We don't find that here. We find, وَأَمَّا بِالنِّعْمَةِ رَبِّ إِضَافَ The favor of your master. The favor of your... This is what called تَقْرِيب. It's brought close to each other. This is a favor of Allah as a result that He is so close to you. That the b'id hasn't been done by the min in the middle. Right? Now, if you study the surah carefully, you'll find the answer to what that favor is. If you look, some of the Mufassirun said, this is the wisdom given to the Messenger wasallam. Others said, annaha nubuwa wa ta'alimiha. It is the prophethood itself and its teachings. Others said, this is all the good that comes to anyone, you should make mention of it. Fahaddith. This is advice to the Messenger wasallam. But let's make a list. The surah is concluding, how is it tied to its beginning? Is there a list of favors Allah did to His Messenger ﷺ in this surah? Number one favor, مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَالَ He didn't bid you farewell. That's a favor of Allah and He's not displeased. Here's a second favor. وَلَلْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى the, the eventual will be better for you than the earliest. Not, a, not just in this life, in the next life too. Here's a third favor. وَلَسَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى He will soon give you, you'll be pleased. Isn't that another favor? Here's another favor. Didn't he find you an orphan and gave you shelter? Alam yajidka yatiman fa'awa. Here's another favor. Wa wajadaka ba'alan fa'ada. Here's another favor. Wa wajadaka a'ilan fa'agna. Subhanallah. Favor after favor after favor after favor after favor. And finally the messengers commanded fa'haddith. But you know what's amazing? Allah does not say fa'haddith hu or fa'haddith ha. Then mention it. He, he could have said, then mention it. He doesn't say mention it. He doesn't say mention it. He just says then mention. Now hadith then implies, not only should you mention the favor, you should make mention to the people of the teachings Allah has given you. Keep mentioning this deen. Keep mentioning this deen. Because of the favors Allah has given you. And Allah says, Be ni'mati rabbik. Because of the favor of your Lord, this amazing favor, compiling them as one, the ultimate favor of your Lord. As a result, what should your response be? Don't worry about anything else, just keep making mention. And hadith implies to speak by the tongue. To speak by, to actually speak up about the favor of Allah and the teachings of this deen. Go back a little, I want to share with you some other things about the surah that I skipped that are really important and we conclude inshaAllah. When we go to the word hada, وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًا فَهَدَى I said he guided. He found you seeking and he, then he guided. We don't find fahadaka, then he guided you. We don't find ka. Not mentioning ka has a number of favors. Fahada laka, for your sake he guided. That's one meaning. Fahadaka, he guided you. 
فَهَدَى بِكَ He guided others by means of you. He guided others by means of you. The irony is you yourself were seeking and Allah gave you so much guidance that you became a source of guidance for others. All of that is captured by Allah not saying فَهَدَاكَ leaving it فَهَدَى All of that is captured, subhanAllah. Similarly, Allah Azza wa says, وَوَجَدَكَ عَائِلًا فَأَغْنَى By not mentioning أَغْنَى كَ He made you free of need. He didn't say that. He said أَغْنَى أَغْنَى لَكَ For your sake, He made غِنَى of you. He made غِنَى for you, for your sake, to you, and then بِكَ Because of you, He gave غِنَى to others. He gave غِنَى to others. SubhanAllah. How Allah Azza wa Jal embodies these profound lessons by not mentioning much. By taking away actually, meanings are enhanced. At-tawassu' fi al-ma'na. Allah Azza wa says, fa'awa. He found you an orphan, and He gave you shelter. Awa laka, awa ka, awa bika. He gave others shelter by means of you too. Not just that He gave shelter, He gave, he gave shelter to others because of you. He gave people the shelter of this deen from the storm of shirk. He gave them shelter of that too. SubhanAllah. How Allah Azza wa captures multitudes of meanings in one word. Then finally, the one I want to repeat, because it's the most beautiful of these. وَلَا سَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى You will be pleased. Not only will you be pleased with Allah, but you will be pleased with the ones Allah will give you. Allah will give you a following. Allah will give you sahaba that you will be pleased with. You yourself will be pleased with. This is described in Surah Al-Fatih. يُعْجِبُ الزُّرَّاعْ لِيَغِيظَ بِهِمُ الْكُفَّارِ The farmer is really happy by the crop. The crop used to be just a little tiny, you know, little tiny blade. It came up, it couldn't even stand on its own. You had to put a trellis next to it, tie it up so it could stand. فَاسْتَغْلَظَ فَاسْتَوَى عَلَى سُوْقِهِ Then it got stronger, then it could stand on its own, right? And the farmer, when he sees the plant is finally mature, he's really happy. Who's the farmer? The ayah began, Muhammadur Rasulullah. وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ أَشِدَّا عَلَى الْكُفَّارِ رُحَمَا بَيْنَهُمْ That's the, where the ayah began. So the, the ayah is actually talking about the Sahaba رضي الله عنهم أجمعين When Allah says فَتَرْضَى He will give you so much that you will be happy and part of that giving is the companions of the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم And part of that gift is the ones that, the, that Allah's Messenger boasted about. He told his companions there are people coming that are better than you. I'm paraphrasing, getting right to the point. We could become part of Fatarda. We could become part of Fatarda. That is an opening Allah Azza wa Jal has given to us. That not only will Allah be pleased with us, we would be the source of pride and the source of joy for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah Azza wa Jal bless all of us with that honor. Inshallah ta'ala, the next surah will be the surah of the study of the continuing favors of Allah Azza wa Jal. As we heard in the salah, Alam nashrah laka sadrak. It will be a continuity of these favors that Allah has mentioned. But we'll see a beautiful contrast between this surah and the next. Next time, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.